Hello, and welcome to the Tech Dirt Podcast. I'm Mike Masnick. And uh, before we get to the podcast today, I did want to note that we are coming up on a milestone here, which is the 300th episode of the podcast. Uh, This episode that you are listening to is number 298. So we are just two away. And in order to celebrate the 300th episode, we're actually going to bring back the show's original two co-hosts, Dennis and Hirsch, to record the 300th episode. And... As a part of that, we're going to experiment with live streaming the recording and possibly with the ability for some people to call in live while we're recording. Uh, We will be recording and streaming the podcast on Thursday, September 30th at 1 p.m. Pacific Time, 4 p.m. Eastern Time. Please check back on TechTurt for the details of where it will be streaming and how you can listen in, uh, if you would like to do that, that is. Uh, We are testing out a new system that not only allows us to do online streaming as we record, but also to do live call-ins. This is very much experimental, and so there is no guarantee that it will work. Uh, But we're going to try to open up the option for live call-ins to our Patreon backers. So if you are a Patreon backer, expect to see an email about this soon. If you are not a Patreon backer, now is as good a time as any to back us there and uh, be able to potentially call in live uh, when we record the 300th episode. And uh, that is our little programming note. And now we will go on to today's podcast. Enjoy. The world is increasingly technological. So we have better get methodical. Bring in precision to critical digital journalism with the singular vision of the modern monocle. Stopping the copyright police from pulling the wall on us. Facing and taking on all the plate to pay to troll. Document the ways that they aim to take control. Scrutinize and do their lies and make them fall. If we don't stand up to them, someone will get for years, there's been talk about the concept of shadow ban- shadow banning as a tool for content moderation. Uh, the most basic form of shadow banning was allowing someone to think that they're posting content somewhere, but only they and no one else can see it. Uh, it seems that the concept of shadow banning uh, comes up well, kind of unfortunately frequently in debates about content moderation where I'll just say some fairly ignorant people uh, who think they're not getting the kind of engagement they deserve insist that they've been shadow banned, uh, usually over political views. Uh, and a lot of that is is kind of uh, garbage. However, there are some aspects of shadow banning that are real uh, in that websites may choose to prioritize some content or deprioritize and kind of hide other content without necessarily making those rules or the results of it clear to users. Uh, Carolina R. is a researcher focusing on moderation, online abuse, uh, conspiracy theories, and online subcultures. She is a blogger, a writer, a pole dance instructor, performer, and activist. And earlier this year, she published a paper on how such deprioritization played out on Instagram, uh, specifically on how it deals with women's bodies, nudity, and sexuality. While Facebook struggles on how to handle moderation of female nudity, uh, and that has been well documented for many, many years, uh, this is some of the first research to look specifically at the impact of such shadow banning slash deprioritization. Then separately, a few months after that paper came out, Uh, Carolina found that her own Instagram account was deleted and got to experience very much firsthand what it is like when moderation choices by big internet companies go perhaps somewhat overboard. Uh, So here to talk about both of these, the paper and her own experience getting banned from Instagram, uh, is uh, Dr. Carolina R. Welcome to the program. Hi, thank you so much for having me. I'm very excited to be talking about my depressing life online. <laughs> well, if you can't talk about it on a podcast, it doesn't it doesn't matter, right? <laughs> so uh, let's let's start by talking about the paper. Can you sort of give just kind of a, a quick summary of what the paper is about and and why you wrote it? Sure. So the paper is essentially. Um, a labor of love and frustration that came from my own experiences of censorship. So when I was doing my PhD, which focused on online abuse and conspiracy theories, so a huge part of online moderation, suddenly Instagram started shadow banning pole dancing. And because um, at the time, I think I was 
three years into my pole dancing career. At the, at the time, I was an amateur pole dancer, but I was also a blogger and a, and a performer. Um, that really affected me. So my, my account was growing. It was giving me work, whether that was, you know, classes to teach or like places to perform and also people to network with. And then suddenly that stopped or it threatened to stop when news or, you know, rumors of the shadow ban started circulating amongst pole dancers. So something really important to say here is that pole dancing comes from stripping. It's a, it's a sport, it's recognized as a, as a sport, it's an art, but there, it's, it's an art and a, um, and a sport that comes from sex workers because sex workers have made it popular and they opened the first pole studios essentially. So that makes it very difficult for an algorithm to moderate because, you know, what's the difference between, for instance, a stripper dancing in a strip club with a in a bikini and a pole dancer dancing on a pole in a bikini, but in a pole studio? Of course, there are nuances. None of the two is worthier than the other of being online. I think they both deserve to be online. But with um, Instagram and Facebook, pur Facebook's puritanical approach to moderation and particularly to sex work after Foster Sesta, um, that has become a problem for the platform to understand. So pole dancers became affected by the shadow ban and very excessive content moderation after sex workers were first affected by it. So in July 2019, the majority of pole dance hashtags suddenly were shadow banned by Instagram. Instagram denied that this was happening initially and they didn't like using the term shadow ban. They, say they, they said they weren't discriminating against specific communities. But then all of a sudden in July, we, we were looking for poll moves um, through our hashtag system and we couldn't find them. We were looking for mainstream accounts of poll dancers and their names were unsearchable in the search bar unless we typed them out in full. So essentially that was wreaking havoc on our community, on how we networked, on how we learned and on how we promoted ourselves. And I found myself in this very unique position of doing a PhD on content moder in content moderation while also being um, affected by that same content moderation in a different scenario. And because I used to work in PR and I have a degree in journalism, I was kind of like, I want to write about this on my blog. I want to inform my community about why this is a big deal and how it affects us. But if I'm going to slag off Instagram, I need to give them the right to reply. Um, I never expected that they would reply, but they did. So that paper is a result of my own experience as a shadow band pole dancer, speaking to a variety of pole dancers about their experiences, leading a fairly successful anti-censorship campaign, but also speaking with Instagram's press team. So it's essentially an autoethnography, um, which I know a lot of quant researchers are going to frown upon. But I think particularly when you're talking about a massive corporation that doesn't like sharing data and insights about its own processes, I think autoethnographies and using user experiences is the only thing we have to understand what happens when things go wrong. Yeah. And I, I think it's, I think that's actually a really interesting point to dig in a little bit on because, you know, there are all these other stories, especially recently about, you know, Facebook kind of hiding data from, from, you know, all sorts of academic researchers or like shutting down the NYU observatory that was trying to collect data. Um, and, you know, so much of, you know, there's a lot of, uh, I hate to use the phrase, but like misinformation, disinformation about content moderation itself. And even, you know, um, you know, a, a significant amount of that comes from the fact that Facebook and, you know, and the other platforms too, but certainly Facebook by, by a large measure are very secretive about a lot of their practices. And so even, you know, I, I find it really interesting uh, you know, that you said, you know, Facebook denied that they were doing this. And some of that, I think, probably comes down to terminology, right? So like all of the platforms tend to deny that they do anything called shadow banning, and they hate the phrase shadow banning. Um, and I mean, in your paper, you talk a little bit about the kind of the history of shadow banning. And I actually think that's, that's interesting. Um, 
so actually, so let me let me ask you that. Like, do, do you want to, you know, sort of maybe explain a little bit of the history, kind of like where the term shadow banning came from, and and you know how that term has been used, and and maybe even how it's changed over the over the the years. Yeah, definitely. So um, the the term itself originated in the noughties, I believe on a forum called Something Awful, so where a lot of things originated, to be honest. Um, And shadow banning was a practice that moderators used to limit the views of, you know, the posts by those that were trolling other users, which, you know, in a way is, you know, something understandable. The practice itself of hiding content has always been there since, you know, the internet kind of came to be, but the origins of the term came from the noughties and from something awful. The thing is, the shadow ban then became a conservative a conspiracy theory, particularly on Twitter, when Republicans were like, oh, I'm being silenced, they claimed right. for the very popular account and from, you know, their opinion pieces and whatever. So it, it was a very... Um, convenient argument to say that they weren't reaching as many people as they were hoping for. The thing is, um, as you say, the shadow ban can be real, but it can also be a conspiracy theory. I don't think either of them are exclusive. And I think, to be honest, the reason why it is a conspiracy theory, it's essentially, it's platform's fault. Because if you don't um, clarify your processes, it's way easier for a user to think that their content isn't doing well, not because it's bad, but because some evil forces inside the platform do not want it to do well. Um, and I think, to be honest, it's, it's very weird as a creator to use platforms like Instagram because it feels sometimes like you're posting into the void. It feels like you're using a product without its instructions leaflet. Posting into the void, by the way, is not my phrase. It's the title of a brilliant, brilliant study on the shadow ban by Hacking, Hacking Hustling. So an amazing collective of sex work, yeah. sex worker researchers. And I really recommend reading that as well to anyone who's listening. But yeah, it feels like you've bought a product or you've subscribed to a product or a service, even if you're not technically paying for Instagram. And you're, you're not being told how to use it, how to make the most out of it. So you're having to try things and it's a trial and error process without the platform telling you much about how to use it to your advantage. So when that happens, users that are not doing that well are, are I think, justified to say, hey, maybe I'm being shadow banned because nobody sees my content. Um, And I think if platforms were only a bit clearer about how and why they decided to demote or promote content, then I think that wouldn't happen. But at the moment, they're so secretive. There's so little transparency about why what stays up stays up or is shown to a lot of people um, that, you know, I think it's only fair and natural that users would have to come up with their own explanation as to why that's happening. And I think, to be honest, Instagram have acknowledged that very recently. I think Maseri published a blog post over, I think, earlier in the summer when they were saying that they were going to notify users when um, their profiles were shadow banned and why their content wasn't recommended. I don't think it's going to make it too much better, but at least if you know that's happening, then that's a behavior that you can modify in the hope to do better in the future. But yeah, they've always hated the term shadow ban. They, they denied using shadow ban, uh, shadow banning with me when I first started interviewing them in the spring of 2019. And then when they ended up apologizing to pole dancers for censoring our hashtags, they said uh, that the hashtags were moderated in error. So they didn't use the term shadow banning. And when uh, in a live Q&A, um, Maseri was asked if the shadow ban was a thing in February 2020, he said it wasn't. And I remember being interviewed uh, by Jessalyn Cook from the Huffington Post about it because the, essentially she wrote an article where she accused him of lying, which in a way he was because he wasn't calling the thing what it what we called it, but you right. know it existed. And then very casually, Instagram admitted to shadow banning black creators in their pledge to do better after the death of George Floyd, you know, when it comes to prioritizing black creators content on their platform. So it's always been there. They just haven't been calling it um, what users call it. But 
I think, you know, they try to shy away from admitting the truth for quite a while. And obviously that causes the, you know, the proliferation of conspiracy theories. Yeah. I mean, I, like I, I, I sort of I see both sides of this, which is part of what makes it complicated, right? I mean, if you go back to kind of like the original purpose and thinking behind shadow banning, it was mostly to deal with trolls, right? And to deal with trollish behavior. And part of the whole point of that was not letting them know, right? To, to let them think that they were posting content and having it effectively have no reach because you don't want the trolls to have reach. And telling them that that's happening sort of wipes out the benefit of, of you know, of that process of shadow banning. It's a little bit different in, in cases of just sort of pure deprioritization because you're you're calling something you know i think i think you have that that facebook's term is like borderline content which is a, a very weird term for 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 a variety of reasons but you know so i can i i see sort of both sides to the argument which is for people who you know are are deprioritized have their content shadow banned however you want to describe it for for reasons that 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 like you know, we think is is wrong or or misplaced or mistaken. Um, you understand why? Like more transparency w- would be really good. It also acts as sort of you know both a way for you to say like this is incorrect. Also a way for like if if you've crossed some line that the policy that the you know the, of the policies of those platforms that you know how to get on the right side of that line. But at the same time, if if for purely malicious actors, giving them that information is often giving them the tools to continue being malicious, right? So how do you, do do you have any thoughts on like, how do you balance those, those two factors? I mean, I think you've raised the whole problem with content moderation, haven't you? (laughs) It's kind of like, how do you make sure that bad stuff doesn't get seen or doesn't get any traction while keeping the good stuff? I don't think anybody has figured it out. And I think your podcast discussions about Section 230 really show how hard this is. But I think the issue here is how platforms understand nudity and sexuality in particular. And particularly after Foster Sesta, um, nudity and sexuality have been the ultimate scapegoat for platforms to you know, show that they were doing something to tackle abuse and also not to get done for you know, doing something that governments might be frowning, frowning upon. But when you um, equate nudity and sexuality, particularly consensual nudity and sexuality, to violence, cannibalism, uh, promoting weapons, stuff that is lumped in with nudity in Instagram's moderation guidelines, then you have a problem because you know, it, it's a it's a huge law of unintended consequences because it's not just nudity; it's also who's nudity. Apparently, plus size users are easier to detect for the algorithm, and they look more naked. Same with black users or visibly, you know, gender non-conforming users. Uh, so it it's kind of like how how do you add nuance to that? And I think platforms moderation hasn't learned to do nuance because it's mainly um, automated. So they can't tell when something is harmful and needs to not be notified or when, you know, it's a glitch, it's a mistake. And And I think, you know, the main thing is that This shadow banning is now affecting a variety of users that actually really need visibility. So for instance, in terms of creators who thrive and work through the platform, if you don't tell them that they're being shadow banned, chances are they'll not reach any new audiences. It will be really hard for them to grow and make a living. And, you know, influencers are creating unions at the moment because it's a job. They they make money through their platform. And similarly, you know, we've seen that in Palestine, we've seen that with, you know, Black Lives Matter related content, we've seen it with activism and with information. If activism and information are viewed as harmful and not worthy of freedom of speech, or not harmful enough to be deleted, but harmful enough to be shadow banned, then what's the point for these people? Why are these people on the platform anyway? You know, it's, it's, it becomes a slippery slope of censorship that becomes very arbitrary. And because we don't know it's happening, because we're gaslighted into thinking that actually our platform, our, our content is there and thriving, but it's not, then we have no way of changing that either. 
Yeah, and I, th- I think there's a really good point that you make that that you you sort of alluded to in what you just said there, and you make it directly in the paper that I think is really important, which is that so many of the conversations, you know, frankly, stupid conversations about content moderation focus on like political speech. And, and you know, none of the platforms are, are focused on political speech. What you're saying is that the, the real impact of it are often like the more marginalized communities, uh, you know, the people who are not going on Fox News and screaming about it, uh, you know, obviously, but, you know, uh, you know, people of color, LGBTQ, all of all of those are the ones who are impacted much more frequently by all of these practices and don't have the, you know, the, you know, aren't able to, to even if they, you know, aren't able to find out about it if it is happening to them or to be able to to speak out about it and and make it as as widely known and i think that that is that's a really important point that you know gets lost in a lot of these debates especially around the political content aspect and you have you know especially in the us but i know this is true elsewhere around the world that you have these sort of two very strongly competing interests of you know in the political speech debate of people who want, you know, all speech to, to be out there, which is an impossible standard. And then you have the people who are demanding that certain speech be taken down without recognizing all of the difficulties and nuances and how that really, you know, uh, that really plays out. And so I think it's, it's important for people to recognize that, um, you know, when you're encouraging or setting up systems like FOSTA-SESTA, which create the incentives to be much more aggressive because of the risk of liability, that the impact is really felt by by much more marginalized groups um, and, and people who don't have as much of a voice and don't certainly don't have uh, as much reach into these platforms to say, hey, you know, what, what, why is my content not showing up anywhere or why am I not getting the kind of engagement that I expected? And so I think that's, that's like a really valuable uh, contribution that, that your paper, you know, highlights and, and, um, and, and, you know, talks about. And, and I mean, in, in the research that you did and in the conversations that you had with Instagram, Facebook people, you know, you, you mentioned FOSTA SESTA. Um, does anyone admit that? Does anyone say that that is part of their calculus? Because as far as I can tell, nobody wants to ever say that, even though like the clear, you know, results are there. Like you can see how much things have changed after FOSTA. But has, has anyone said anything to you as you were doing your research on this? So it seems like FOSTA SESTA is more of a boogeyman than the word shadow ban. <laughs> they don't like it. So every time I've been asking them about FOSTA SESTA, they, you know, their their press department has a masterful um, approach in avoiding answers. So they would say that they comply with local law and with general, you know, something like um, common sense standards, something like that. Um, But then, you know, I'm in the UK, so why am I being censored according to a law that was approved in America. So they've never really mentioned that directly to me. But um, so just to give you a bit of a panoramic and background in uh, the type of people I talk to. So initially, I started talking mainly with press. Uh, Those were the people who would always answer me in relation to articles on my blog. And that continued up until December 2019. Then I started a petition, which is currently at over 121,000 signatures for Instagram to reconsider their terms of use, particularly when it comes to nudity and sexuality. Um, So when that petition was gaining traction and also through academic contacts, I started speaking with Facebook policy. So actual people in charge of making or enforcing or, you know, discussing the the policies that they use. so those people never refer to foster sesta but then when my uh when, when i started more actively posting about issues regarding moderation on my instagram some people let's say whistleblowers would mention foster sesta so some people that followed me or some people that interacted with me that were 
inside the company but didn't speak on an official capacity. So essentially the effect is being felt, we all know it. Why did it start being felt in 2019 when Foster Sesta was approved shortly before? You know, I, I, it's right. kind of like calling it what it is, but they haven't used the actual name officially. Yeah. I, 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 I wonder, because Facebook famously was the, the, the tech company that supported FOSTA, if they're, you know, they're extra conscious of, of not mentioning it and, and sort of the impact of it, um, which is just kind of kind of crazy. Um, so let, let's move on to, to the other story that I mentioned in the opening, which is that, you know, a few months after this paper came out, you yourself got banned from Instagram. So, so what happened there? Yeah, so it's quite random, to be honest. So I think, um, as I said, I have been having regular communications with both Instagram press and Facebook policy. So that's quite hilarious in itself because they know who I am. Like they know my right. face, they know my handle, they know what I post. Um, and I've been informing particularly policy of the effects that their moderation policies have on users. I did a survey together with other users that I communicated with them and they were horrified by the results and how powerless people felt. Um, so I was known to them. And um, since their new terms of use were approved, it's very difficult to post links on Facebook without being deleted. So much that I was told, if you post a sexually suggestive picture and something like send me a DM or swipe up for my website or you know link in bio, something like that, you can be understood to be promoting some sort of OnlyFans or you know nude content service, whatever. So that might get you deleted. Of course, sexually suggestive according to whom and what's the threshold and whatever, it's not for us to know. Um, but that being said, I did post about it very recently and then um, I posted a few days after a picture with my 92 year old grandma. And then the day after I log on to my account to find that it was disabled. So just to, I mean, for anyone, like my, my Instagram is public, everybody can go and see it. Uh, I wear really tiny outfits, so I'm really confused as to why I was banned after the picture with my grandma. It's like, ass is fine, but we draw the line at grandma's. I, I, I don't understand. Um, but um, yeah, so that, that happened. I was deleted and also from what Instagram and Facebook say, you're meant to get a warning that your account might be deleted. You get strikes. So when you, you know, violate some sort of policy, your post is removed. And then if you have too many strikes, it's like your account might be deleted. You get an actual notification of that. I got nothing of the sort. I had no active violations whatsoever. So. It was a very stressful 24 hours. Um, I emailed press in London because it was 7 p.m. or 8 p.m., something like that. Obviously, they weren't at work. Um, I emailed policy in San Francisco. They say that look into it. And I emailed all my media contacts and I tweeted about it furiously. Because when I get deleted, I get deleted all the time. I also got deleted four times on TikTok. So I just use my Twitter to talk about it as much as I can. Um, so I did that and uh, I, I had a backup account that my followers pointed people to to kind of report in setting that something was going wrong. Um, and then, so I didn't hear much up until the following day when press told me that my account had been deleted in error and that it was going to be restored. Policy gave me no other information. They said that by the time they were active, um, pretty much the issue had already been resolved, so they had nothing to say. But then again, one of the whistleblowers in my following said that it was a case of false positives. So maybe, you know, a variety of things that I posted created a cocktail of deletion without a warning. But to this day, I don't know what happened, not for sure. Um, although, my ex in my experience and in the experience of a lot of other users in my network and in my community whose accounts were deleted, uh, we were deleted after reporting either cyber flashing, so I got a bunch of dick pics that day that I just reported, and other people reported it in impersonation and then got deleted. So I don't know if that's correlated or related at all. I have no idea, but that is happening quite a lot. 
and also shows you the power imbalance on platforms. Um, but also, I think what this really highlights is that I got my profile back because I'm a freak case. I'm an academic that researches on online moderation who gets moderated heavily, uh, who also happens to be a pole dancer. <clears throat> but if I were just an average Jane, chances are my profile would be gone. So what's happening at the moment is that I'm having to take on requests to Facebook policy to look into deletions. And as a result, a variety of accounts have been restored, but it shouldn't be up to me to do this. And I shouldn't have this privilege because of who I am. Their systems should work. Yeah. <laughs> or have yeah. at least decent appeals, you know? Yeah. No, I, I mean, I, I've, I've gone through the same thing, obviously, because of all the, the, the writing and, and talking that I do on these topics and the conversations I've had with the platforms. I have, you know, on, on more than a few occasions had to help out friends or, or people that I know who were, you know, it, it appeared banned or suspended improperly. And that system works, but feels unfair. And it, it feels like this, this is not how it should be done. And it should not be like, you know, based on the, the public profile of, of the people who, you know, you know, that they shouldn't be able to, to influence the process, right? It shows a, a weakness in the overall process. And certainly you're right, the appeals process. I mean, I think there's, there's a whole area of study that needs to be done on how these appeals process processes work, because, you know, I think what we've seen over and over again are even in egregious cases, the appeals turn up the same results, and it's it's unclear how most of these companies handle actual appeals, and you know, and and yeah, and and to, you know, again, to give them the benefit of the doubt, somewhat, um, like you could see, like if they're inundated with, you know, they, they have a lot of content to moderate, and there are reasons why mistakes are made, and if the appeals process is merely going through the exact same process again to make sure they did it right right according to the rules the first time you're still going to keep making the exact same mistakes over and over again um but that doesn't that doesn't help the situations when the process that they have put in place leads to those bad results and you know i i i'm i'm sympathetic because i don't know how to how, how you actually solve that especially at the scale of these platforms but i think we can agree that the way the system is working today is not is not great and and leads to an awful lot of collateral damage yeah, and I think that ties in really well with the very recent Wall Street Journal investigation into how, you know, some accounts are whitelisted and prioritized on Facebook and Instagram, which I would also like to say is not news to creators. I mean, we know that, like, we pole dancers, but also particularly strippers, we have to censor ourselves um to make sure that we're not deleted while the likes of cardi b and you know other people who use stripping aesthetic and cardi b was a stripper herself so you know it's only fair that she does that they are left up because they are celebrities so there is a clear disparity in what is allowed by big accounts and what isn't allowed on smaller accounts and actually the whole thing about you know um, big accounts having a double review. I don't even think that's that secret because Facebook policy told me that I think in January or February. So I think it's it's common knowledge um, and it's due to your profile. And, and don't get me wrong, like I wouldn't want to be Facebook and Instagram at the moment. I think it's, it's an absolute mess what they're having to deal with. It's hard. I, I don't have all the answers. I think what I blame them for is the hubris because um and and also the the utter um unwillingness it seems not not with policy workers because they listen but at the top level to take on feedback because if you have a legion of users that are telling you hey we have these experiences and things are not working it shouldn't take a pr shit show for you to fix your processes and I think at the moment, Facebook and Instagram in particular operate on a PR damage control uh, standpoint Absolutely. and not on a we care about our users standpoint. Yeah, yeah. I, I, it's amazing how much of the decision making is driven by sort of PR and, and sort of in reaction to things as opposed to thinking through these things. Again, you know, somewhat to, to give the 
you know, the benefit of the doubt to them, it is somewhat impossible to think through all of the scenarios, right? I mean, there are so many scenarios. You have however many billions of users, you know, in Facebook's case. Um, and so I, I, I recognize that. But it is it is fairly remarkable how much of it is, is driven by PR. And, and you know, on the, on the note of like, you know, the the different uh, different treatment for different people. The, the Wall Street Journal story, which if, if people haven't heard it, it, you know, basically that it was revealed that Facebook has a list that's like 5 million people who basically the rules don't directly apply to them. Or they have sort of a slightly different set of rules. And, and it's interesting, you know, a lot of people, you know, reacted to that. And I think totally reasonably that 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 feels extremely unfair for for obvious reasons um, but there was an interesting discussion that I saw from uh, started by by uh, well it was uh, uh, Dave Wilner um, who was Facebook's original uh, content policy person who sort of explained how that happens I mean he wasn't he wasn't apologizing for he wasn't you know forgiving. He was saying, you know, this is still bad, but you have to recognize like how this happens, which in, to some extent, that sort of setup is an attempt, not a good one, but it is an attempt to add in some level of context. You know, we keep talking about how many of these things are sort of, these are decisions that are made that are context free. And that's part of the problem. If you understood all the context and what is happening, what this user is trying to do, you would recognize that it is not bad or malicious or problematic or borderline as, as Facebook uses the term. Um, and so having a, a sort of, you know, white list of users is one way to sort of say there is additional context here but that's it's a really really broad brush approach to doing that and and leads to really questionable results as as the wall street journal article kind of highlighted um but you know i i, I don't it feels like there has to be a better way especially for a company that large <laughs> yeah i think like that really highlights the issues with content moderation doesn't it because yeah. this approach is like that doesn't have any nuance, doesn't have any context, but it really shows you how Facebook is acting like a global government. Should they have that many users and should they, an American company, be in charge of moderating their content without context? And should that moderation be completely automated? I mean, also the fact that their moderators, their human moderators are an underpaid workforce who are uneducated to the issues that they're having to moderate. To me, that's mind boggling because yeah. imagine if our police was not aware of the issues for which it had to, you know, enforce the law. It just makes no sense. And I think, you know, I'm thinking of my own community, of the pole dancing community. It's so varied. There are so many, you know, fights and disagreements without the pole dancing community. There are people who understand pole as a sport and as an art and who reject its stripping past. And there are people like me who are grateful to sex workers for having created a sport that we love. But how can you come to that from the outside without knowing anything about it? And is a pole dancer performing a pole art ballerina routine the same as a pole dancer performing a stripper style routine? They're not, but sometimes you get a super, you know, fully clothed pole fitness routine being deleted. And as I said, I want all the naked ladies out there. I don't want anybody to be censored for, you know, performing on a pole, whether that's in a studio or in a strip club. But the algorithm cannot apply that nuance because it doesn't know our community just like it doesn't know many other communities and neither do the moderators so i think it's very important to get insiders that are paid well and that are not paid by the moderation <laughs> uh, to right. to kind of do that job yeah it, it, and it's you know it's really obviously there are problems with with both the algorithmic approach uh, and the, the human moderator approach. And also there's sort of a human cost to, to the human moderator approach. And, you know, it, I'm reminded of, there was a documentary a few years ago, I don't know if you've seen it, called The Cleaners, 
um, which is it's it's a really eye opening and and I thought really interesting documentary and it, it really focuses on on Facebook moderators in in the Philippines I think it's been a few years since I saw it and you know there there's sort of one incredible part where they kind of you know they're talking to one of these moderators and she more or less admits that like um, she has absolutely no problem with any kind of nudity or sexual content like that's wonderful to her she's she's like really happy to to leave that kind of content up but anything that is religious that that strikes her as blasphemous in in her viewpoint is horrible and has to be taken down and you're like oh you begin to realize like oh every individual's like own personal biases come out in these decisions and even if they have kind of a clear set of rules and this is what is allowed and this is what is not it's impossible to separate that from 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 your own biases and then you sort of multiply that times you know you have however many thousands of moderators, you have so many different cultures, you have so many different subcultures, you have so many different languages, you have so many different rules and different countries and, and laws in each of those countries. And, and you add in that just the individual perspectives of the moderators, you add in the algorithms that can't determine nuance, and you begin to realize what what an impossible <laughs> mess this whole thing is. And 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 anyone who thinks that there's like some easy answer to all of it is you know is going to be very very disappointed <laughs> because because there's not. But that doesn't mean at the same time that doesn't mean like that that everyone just throws up their hands and says you know well you can't can't do anything so don't do anything right that that we should always be looking for how can these processes and systems be improved um and i i think that's a lot of you know what 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 you're focused on and what what you're talking about yeah and i think you know my my number one pet peeve in these discussions is when people say well facebook is a private company they can do what they want and i completely disagree they can't do what they want i don't think any private company does what they want uh, they have to adhere to laws including human rights standards and so should facebook and on top of that facebook pitched itself to us as the herald of freedom of speech the company that facilitated the arab spring so they have acted multiple times as a civic space. They like playing it both ways, which is why in another paper I argue that social media should be viewed and regulated as a corpo civic space. So a corporate company with some, some civic obligations. And obviously I don't have all the answers, but even if Facebook do say that they use human rights in their moderation, at the moment I can't always see that. So I think if government um, law or you know government um, interference has to come in, I think human rights has to be the first thing to do. Because I think the more we put in ad hoc laws like Foster Sesta, the more platforms are going to act conservatively because they don't want to be hit on the in their bottom line. Yeah, I mean the the risk of liability is is a is a strong motivator for for lots of companies. I mean I I think that the like we could go sort of deep on a tangent here and we probably shouldn't but like the the whole like debate over like civic space or or you know the the phrase we usually use here is like public square i think that gets really tricky very quickly um and i i i'm i'm you know I, i'm not sure i i agree with you on that because i think that becomes very challenging i i think part of the issue from my standpoint is that um and, and Facebook might be a unique case just because of its sheer size and scale, um, that that becomes somewhat different. I think for other platforms that are smaller and are more targeted, like that is kind of an important part of what they are doing, which is they are sort of structuring themselves to create a kind of user base and a kind of community that they want. And any sort of risk of them sort of being declared a public square civic space challenges that and also takes away their ability to sort of focus on the kinds of community and the kind of usage that they want. Um, the question then is, you know, does does that also apply when when the entire world is on your platform, which is the case with Facebook? Um, I, I I can I can see the arguments on on both sides of that, and I also fear that like focusing sort of overcorrecting on like on the human rights aspect of it also leads to challenges. I mean, obviously, like, I mean, th this is the point of all of this, right? And there are, there is no perfect solution and you're always going to run into, into challenges. Um, but you also get the, that case of, 
you know, if you're focusing on on human rights and a human rights aspect, that does allow for for some level of trolling and abusive behavior as well. And platforms have legitimate reasons to want to try and block that also. And so, you know, all of these things have trade offs. And and so, um, I worry a little bit about the framing of like declaring something a civic space or or, or public square. Yeah, I mean, to be honest, I do too, which is why I think it needs to be both things. Like, we need to recognize that it's both corporate and civic at the same time. And that's, you know, that happens in a lot of places already, like a mall, for instance. Like, you can't just be kicked out of a mall because they don't like your face. Um, You have to have done something. So I think, like, the approach on platforms, particularly over certain content at the moment is very punitive and there's no right to appeal and there's no right to kind of understand what's going on. You have no right over your content and your data and over understanding what went on. And I think that's what needs to change. And that's why, you know, I I think it's important to kind of not be too stuck on either the corporate or the civic side. But I think Something that's really important that I think is already happening on some smaller platforms, which might be happening because they're small, is that they're leaving users more in charge of what they see. Because I, for instance, do not want to see some triggering content that might, you know, hurt me for one reason or the other. But I can also understand that some other people might want to see it. And it's not up to me to say that shouldn't be on. And I think at the moment, what's happening is that. Facebook wants to please absolutely everyone because of its sheer size. And it's weird, like, would you ban all sex in movies because a child might run into the theater? Would you ban all sex because some sex might not be consensual? I think we need, we desperately need nuance in these cases and we need sometimes to make sure that users can tailor their experience on platforms rather than platforms tailoring it for them. I've had, so my whole experience on TikTok and my deletions has largely been due to the fact that as soon as I do a viral, users are like, there are kids on this platform. Are you not ashamed? And they mass report me. And then obviously they get so many reports that my account comes down. But my account doesn't come down because it violates terms. It comes down because of mass reporting and because users don't want to see my posts. And I'm like, okay, you don't want to see pole dancing, but you don't have to, you know, get rid of me. And this is because users do not have room to tailor their experience. Yeah. I, th- I think that that's a really, really good point. And it's, it's, you know, a lot of the stuff that I've been writing about for the last few years is on like the importance of, of pushing the power out from the, the center to the, to the edges of the network, right? Let, because, you know, there are however many 8 billion people on the planet, all of them have different standards. You know, we were talking about that just in the, in the context of the people who are doing the moderating, but, you know, that applies to the end users as well. You know, the people have different standards of what they're interested in, what they really do not want to see and would prefer not to. And it shouldn't be, you know, Facebook's decision as to, and as to what that is. If the, the users, you know, were given more power to to control that themselves or that they could sort of hand that off to to multiple different third parties so it's not facebook deciding it but maybe it's you know some organization that i feel you know i'm going to hand off my my moderation to to some other company or organization or you know nonprofit that i trust and, and let them do it for me um, I think that is that's such a you know such a powerful possible solution um, that I hope that the companies move towards adopting. But but who knows? Yeah, yeah. Anyways, uh, Carolina, uh, I apologize, Carolina. I just said it wrong. Thank thank you so much for 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 taking the time to to have this discussion. Uh, I think your paper is really interesting. We'll we'll link to it. We'll also link to your blog post where you discuss uh, getting deleted uh, from Instagram. And um, this is this is this was really you know I, you know I talk about this stuff all the time. It's always great to hear different perspectives and thoughtful perspectives on on how this this impacts all different kinds of people. Um, and so th- this was a great discussion. Thank you so much for, for taking the time. Thank you so much for having me. Really honored to join the ranks of people who <laughs> try to discuss a better moderation system without finding an answer. Yes, yes. Well, you know, that is the unfortunate reality is that there is no real answer. But but hopefully over time we can sort of uh, 
move in better directions and iterate towards something that is that is better. But uh, anyways, th- thank you again, and uh, thanks to everyone for listening. And we'll be back someone next week. Get, huh, to grab a shovel and think of the cat. Huh, if we don't stand up to them, someone will get. Huh, to grab a shovel and